This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History and the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. We are here today with Professor Dr. Mark Hull, who is, in addition to being a historian of Germany and of 20th century war crimes, also a lawyer. Welcome, Dr. Hull. Thank you. We are also here with Dr. Bill Nance, one of our World War II historians. Good to be here. And we're here today to talk with Dr. Hull about some research he's been doing recently into uh, anti-Semitic propaganda in early and mid 20th century Germany. Um, and how that kind of played out in the, the, the war crimes trials uh, at, at the end of and after World War II. Um, so Dr. Hull, if you could introduce us to the personalities you've been looking at and kind of explain the, the world in which they lived. I want to look at the issue of incitement. Incitement becomes a big deal at the Nuremberg trials from 1945 to 46. It's included as one of the constituent elements of crimes against humanity. They're at the main trial at Nuremberg, and there's a main trial, and then there's a 12 subsequent proceedings that go afterward. Two of the figures in the main trial, uh, one specifically and one somewhat, were accused of crimes against humanity by, by virtue of what they wrote or what they said, as opposed to any sort of causal or direct link to uh, the Holocaust or, or mass killing. Julius Stryker is, is the most famous of these. He was a newspaper publisher, uh, a, just a vile anti-Semite uh, from the 1920s through the 1930s and through World War II. Uh, he publishes a weekly newspaper that features articles, um, cartoons, editorials all of which, almost without exception, is directed toward anti-Semitism, encouraging hatred of Jews, encouraging uh, essentially the, the Jews, uh, what, what, what must be done with them or to them. So this is the, the Daily Stormer, I think? It's Der Stürmer. Okay. Uh, Stürmer translates in this case best as uh, agitator. Okay. Um, so you've got this, this publisher. Um, who are the other figures you've been looking at? I, I looked at three, and the reason I chose these three is they were all three cases in the, 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 the newly created German justice system after World War II. They were accused in denazification proceedings uh, for participating in crimes against humanity by means of incitement. So I have two motion picture personalities. Uh, the film director, uh, you know, mainstream film director, Veit Harlan, uh, who produced and directed and, and, and wrote uh, a movie called Jud Sus. Uh, I have a second director named Fritz Hippler, who put together a film called uh, De Ewige Jude, The Eternal Jew. And thirdly is the cartoonist that worked for Stryker at his newspaper, uh, a guy named by the name of Philip Ruprecht, and weirdly, even though Stryker is the publisher and the editor, if you were to query most people then and certainly most people now, the images that Ruprecht drew have more lasting impact than did anything that Stryker ever wrote or, any, uh, that, he, or that he said. So it's the visual imagery that I wanted to look at and whether or not you could find a case for incitement by film, documentary, or cartoon. So you're talking about incitement. Right. And one of the cool things about you is that you're also a lawyer and kind of your other half. Uh, so can you talk to us about like, what incitement means legally? It means that this does vary by jurisdiction and uh, in the case of the United States, by state or federal or the military or internationally. It means to encourage someone else to commit a crime. 
It can be you ask somebody or tell somebody or suggest to somebody that they should do, go do something else. Uh, in the case of uh, if I uh, get up in front of a podium and I say that uh, I think it's, it's important that we all go out and eliminate anyone who is left-handed. That would be a, I am inciting people to go commit a crime against people that are left-handed. In the case, for example, in the Rwandan genocide, uh, there is a case in front of the international, there was a case in front of the International Criminal Court called the Media Case. It concerned broadcasters on state radio that were not only whipping up crowds uh, of Hutu to kill Tutsi, uh, inhabitants of Rwanda, but they were actually coordinating groups of killers to find their victims. So not only did they encourage or abet the killing, they actually helped to coordinate it. And I think that's one of the interesting things is, if, for example, in the case of incitement, do you have to show or an intent for the final thing to happen or not? Do you have to show a causal connection between the words and the action? Do you have to prove that somebody was influenced by the things that were spoken or written or shown? So, for instance, like in these three individuals that you're uh, taking a look at, were they just part of the Nazi zeitgeist, or were they actually helping to create that climate? It, it depends on who you ask. So one of the questions is if you are trying to figure out if they had an intent to commit a crime against humanity. If you ask the defendants, of course, they're going to tell you, well, of course not. That I'm only that movies are make believe, and that I it's a fictionalized version of of, of a story that already existed. Uh, Fritz Hippler maintained that he didn't even realize there was going to be a documentary; that he was just filming incidental scenes from a ghetto, although that turned out to be a lie. And Philip Ruprecht, the cartoonist, said, "Well, of course, he had no intent to harm anybody. All he was doing was drawing caricatures that he was told to draw by Ulysses Stryker." So unless you can prove otherwise, unless one of them are any of them are stupid enough to write, I intend these things to lead to, to murder, you've got a very difficult time showing that part. If, on the other hand, you're trying to show a connection between word and action, you have a different sort of problem. You will never get, and there never was, a witness that testified on the stand for the prosecution who said that the reason that I did these things was because Julius Strucker, his cartoons, told me to. No one ever testified that I did these things because I watched the, the movie. And nobody ever testified that I, I did these things because I watched the documentary. Although common sense would tell you that there is a degree of psychological conditioning that is necessary to make otherwise non-criminal people kill. And that brings up an interesting point. As you talk about the psychological conditioning, uh, there, the book, uh, what is it, Ordinary Men, that came out about the uh, one of the uh, SS police battalions. Yeah, I, I insist all my students read that. Uh, can, can you tell us why you insist on having them read that? It, it's one of the, the great mysteries, and I've struggled to understand it, and I don't think that I ever will, which is the process, again, by which you take people that are otherwise at least marginally functioning members of society and something happens to them or with them and you turn them into people that will kill thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people because someone tells them to do it. And the weird part about it is that if you look at their records after the war, and this includes people that were put on trial at Nuremberg or after Nuremberg, they aren't reoffenders. They don't fit into the pattern of, of normal criminal behavior. They were law-abiding people before the Nazis. They become law-abiding people again after the Nazis are gone. So something must have happened in a very complex way that we probably can't untangle between the 1920s and 1945. And Christopher Browning in the book Ordinary Men, I think, takes as good a shot as anyone to try to explain what that might be. 
that this our societies have a very complex relationship with authority, with conditioning, and further, I think most usefully, that he points out that this isn't a German phenomenon, that the same sort of things happen wherever people exist, that you could easily, under the right circumstances, get Americans or people from, well, you had people from Rwanda do it, but anyone anywhere on the earth can be shifted from one thing to the other and then perhaps shifted back. So before we dive into some of the details of these men and, and what they did, let's talk about kind of the general ecosystem of anti-Semitism in Europe and in Germany. So if you look at the images that someone like Ruprecht made, they have a lot of the kind of standard anti-Semitic stereotypes we've seen for centuries. Uh, Jews as rapacious sexually, Jews as people who control money, the, the visual stereotypes, Jews of people with large noses, with, um, I'm doing air quotes, ethnic looks, dark hair, um, and those kind of images. So walk us through a little bit of the history of these kind of anti-Semitic ideas and images in, in Europe and maybe in Germany specifically. Well, both of the, the films as well as Ruprecht cartoons drew upon a very vicious, rich tradition uh, from the Middle Ages forward, uh, something that accelerated with, the, with movable type and with printing and with literacy. So whereas before then it was difficult to get commonality or standardization with hatred against Jews, uh, after the mid-1700s, it became much easier and, and much easier again by the time we get to the 19th century. So you start to see crystallized in at least a part of the public imagination the idea of the Jew as the other. There's an, you're right, there's an ethnic look, there's an ethnic way of being, there's an otherness to it. And one of the things that the Nazis were able to do First of all, that had to that had to to pre-exist the Nazis. Otherwise, the Nazi thing would have been too too much of a break. But they were able to draw upon that and go to the next logical point, which is not only be aware of them or to say that the Jews are a danger, but to go first to the Jews need to be removed from us. And then the second, the next logical point is the Jews need to be removed, period. Uh, you can't, the Nazis aren't the beginning of the thing. The Nazis are only a, sort of the end result of something that had been brewing or simmering below the surface everywhere. It happens in America. It happens in Britain. It happens certainly in, in France. It was n notorious in the 19th century. And the circumstances just happened to be right to allow the Germans to do things that, again, probably could have occurred elsewhere. So let's take that to the next step. So there's this ecosystem of anti-Semitism that's already there. Yes. So, and then these uh, these gentlemen come on board. Now, are they, before, do they kind of predate the Nazi party and then they just get co-opted into that larger Nazi process? Are they... Uh, does the Nazi party kind of come up, go out and find them and say, hey, we like, uh, we like the cut of your jib, come on board? Uh, what's kind of the relationship there? It's, it's a little hard to, dis, to, to untangle. Um, so going back at least, we'll say, just arbitrarily 1900, you have in the kind of whack job fringe movements in, in Europe, uh, so in the Vienna, for example, where Hitler... Uh, was a young man. Uh, there's an anti-Semitic mayor. There are anti-Semitic tracks. You would have tripped over it. But only in a, in a, in a more so in, in certain classes, and, and it would have been present, but a little more subtle the further up the food chain that you got. Uh, and the same thing, too, was for, for Imperial Germany and, again, for, for the French Republic. Um, Anti-Semitism is there. It is more present in some places than in others. And when the Nazi party gets started immediately after the First World War, as it turns out, it, it's, 
baked into the Nazi Party DNA. If you look at the Nazis, you know, 25-point program, uh, this is 1920, it's there. Uh, it's an essential component of Nazism from the very beginning that Jews must be excluded from German life. Now, as the Nazis sort of, you know, evolved and they tried this thing and they tried the other thing, I think eventually they came to the point, especially when the war, nature of the war changed and they found themselves with a, a sizable Jewish population in the East, that certain people uh, in responsible positions thought, well, I, there, there's only one other remaining thing that we haven't done yet or tried yet, and that's just killing all of them. So were these filmographers and the uh, cartoonists, were these gentlemen founding members of the Nazi party, or were they just kind of um, fellow travelers that then uh, then got brought into the system? They're, they're, they're all of those. So in the case of Veit Harlan, who again, is, is, he's a film director of, of some renown. Um, he was never a member of the party, but he was deeply Im enmeshed in the Nazi party's upper echelon. So he was, he was friends, or at least an acquaintance with Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister. He was wealthy, he was well regarded. Fritz Hippler, who did the, you know, the quasi-documentary, uh, was a Nazi party member. He was a member of the SS, not, not in the, the, the part of the SS, for the most part, where you actually have to do anything. He was just sort of like a, 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 an SS hanger-on, but he, was a, he, he advanced to the rank of lieutenant colonel in the SS. Third guy, Philip Ruprecht, uh, said that he accidentally joined the SS, or that he was he, he was sort of an as honor one does, yeah. right? <laughs> but he said that in, in his in his in his hearing, uh, which of course the prosecutor and the judges didn't they didn't find that credible. I don't um, think most people would. <laughs> yeah, go figure. <laughs> that it was almost like he got a circular in the mail and he didn't realize and he sent it back. But uh, so you have th this rainbow. Uh, or rather continuum of people whose involvement was at different levels. So Harlan, not a member of the SS, but in the higher reaches of the Nazi state. Hippler, who's a mid-grade guy in, in, in so many ways. And then Ruprecht, who's kind of at the low end. I, I think one of, the, one of the issues, too, and, and Browning talks about this in his book, is that circumstances have to be correct for people to do the kinds of things that he talks about, so mass killing and extermination. And Harlan, for a variety of reasons, Ruprecht, for a variety of reasons, Hitler, for a variety of reasons, happened to find themselves in a position where their self-interest and their career was better served by riding the, the anti-Semitic wave. So in the case of Hitler, which is the most vile of, 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 of at least of the motion pictures, the, the famous image in that is he talks about and then shows rats in, in grain, teeming rats and getting into the grain. And he had before talked about in Jews are rats and he has a graphic where it has a, the map of the world and arrows and, and plague and pestilence going to places. The thing that he leaves un, unasked and unanswered is, what are you supposed to do with a rat that gets in the grain? If the Jew is the rat and the grain is the German population, what should you do now? He doesn't have to ask that because it's obvious from the imagery. But of course, if when Hitler is Hitler, excuse me, Hitler is put on trial. His explanation is, well, that had nothing to do with me. I, I, I didn't, I wasn't involved with that at all. How did these men see their work? You mentioned we kind of have a spectrum of them from a, a party, uh, it, both literal and political party attendee to uh, a cartoonist who may be at best a functionary. How did they see what they were doing? Did they see themselves as making art? Do they see themselves as making, you know, the edification of the party? It, it, it there, there are two vistas here. If you, you ask, if seemingly, if their impression at the time, 
So at the time that Yud Sus, the, the motion picture, came out, and the time that, that the Eternal Jew comes out, and the time that, that, that Ruprecht is making his cartoons, they seem to be proud of what they have done and their accomplishments. So this is a wonderful film. This is a useful documentary. This is a very apt cartoon to go with, with the, 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 the theme of, of the magazine or the theme of the newspaper. After the fact, universally, all of them put place themselves in the victim category. After the fact, after 1945. After, after, after the war's over and after people start looking at their Nazi past. Uh, it is, I was forced to do the film. I was forced, I didn't even know I was making a documentary, but if I did, I was forced to do it. And Ruprecht's thing is, I only did what Stryker told me, and I would have gotten in trouble if I had try, if I had not done it. Just like he accidentally joined the SS. Exactly. So, I like uh, I like talking with you a lot because uh, you bring the legal aspect in addition to just the historian aspect. So, help let, help us build the prosecution for these for these gentlemen. So, you've talked about how they viewed their uh, acts when they were doing when they were actually in the act of doing it. You've talked about kind of their association there. So when we talked kind of at the beginning about uh, kind of the legal definition of incitement, kind of the varying definitions. So could you help us kind of like start to build the ca the legal case against these gentlemen, uh, or what was actually used in the court? It, it's important. The, the three cases I looked at. It's important to remember that they were denazification proceedings. So these are civil, essentially civil proceedings that could carry social disability. So, for example, it might say in a judgment that you couldn't have this job or you would pay a fine or that you couldn't own a car or that you're restricted in a variety of, you couldn't vote, for example. Uh, you could do up to five years in a labor camp as punishment if you were convicted as, depending on what tier of offender that, that they found you to be. So, it's not a criminal trial in the sense that you have to go through the, the elements that I would have to go through today if I was trying to prove that somebody was guilty of incitement. The court had to be convinced that this was the intent, that they were doing this knowingly and, and voluntarily and that it had an effect. So what you ended up with is a very wide, disparate, sentences that were afforded to the people. Harland, uh, essentially, he, he, he went free. There were two trials, actual, actual trials for Harlan, and he was acquitted both times. Although, weirdly, the, the judge that heard the case on appeal was the same judge that acquitted him in the first trial. So, uh, Hitler, there were some serious, uh, very able prosecutors that hated him and what he did, and what Hitler managed to do for the most part was keep moving jurisdictions to keep the courts from, from latching on to him. And with Ruprecht, Ruprecht didn't have any friends in high places, so he got convicted and sent to a labor camp. But the reality of it was that when the Federal Republic of, you only have this brief window between 1946 and 1948, and if it happened after that, it wasn't, these sort of things weren't going to occur at all because we, we, we were bringing the Federal Republic of Germany back. And part of the deal with Konrad Adenauer was amnesty for Nazi offenders. And the Americans had already decided back in 1946 that they were washing their hands of it. It was just, they, 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 they didn't have the they couldn't handle the idea that we're going to have to sort through 40 million f files and see who did what to whom. And it's better if we just kick this over to the Germans and let them deal with it. So the 40 million number is the estimated number of people who would have to be denazified? Right. So you had to fill out a questionnaire, and you're supposed to list whatever your, your, your different affiliations with the Nazi party and what you may have been involved with. Those questionnaires have to be compared against captured Nazi records party membership records and various things. And those records, at least at first, were only located in, in, Ber in Berlin. So logistically, this was just not, you, you weren't going to be able to do it. Yeah, and and you, you bring up a kind of an interesting question. Um, people who are familiar with, with war crimes and war crimes trials probably automatically go to the famous courtroom at Nuremberg. 
and the very obvious case you might make against a Hermann Goering, right? The, the, the deputy Reichsmarshal, the head of the Luftwaffe, Hitler's right-hand man, the arch looter of Europe, right? Um, so that rap sheet kind of writes itself. But how did the victorious allies look at somebody like a Veit Harlan, a society man who made films, or a, you know, again, a functionary like a like a Ruprecht? How how did they approach themselves this process of prosecution for people who maybe weren't the the Goebbels or the the Gerings? I I think it. There were so many things going on immediately after the war, and even during the Nuremberg trial. So one of the one of the the, the purposes of the trials was to to denazify Germany and ensure Germany's uh, return to the family of nations as a democratic state. So the question is, then, do you wish to get hunt down and, and and weed out every one of them, everybody who has some degree of a Nazi past, or do you have to sort of rank order? Do you put in first position the, the killers and the organizers of the of, of the killers? So the SS Einsatzgruppen, or who, who, who murdered a million people. Do you, where, where do you put them based on what you think that they, on they've done? And I don't think we, we didn't have time or the interest with the rise of, of, of the Soviet Union or the, the, the renewal of the Soviet threat to sort of to ever find an answer to that. How minimal is, is, is what does that really mean? So can you accept a certain degree of Nazi ties and still allow somebody back into civil society? In the case of the German judiciary, for example, 100% of the people that were qualified and trained lawyers under the Nazi system had to at least be a member of a Nazi affiliate organization. It doesn't mean they were committed Nazis, but it means that they had there, there was there's a Nazi stamp on a book someplace near, near where their name is. If you plan to have any sort of functioning judicial system after the war, you have two choices. You can either accept people that do have a Nazi connection, but you, you're trying to figure out which ones are worse than others. Or you can get rid of them all and start over from zero and have people that are not remotely trained or connected to the law administer justice. It's pretty easy to figure out which one, which one of those is the better of the two solutions. So now you're already accepting some degree of Nazism, but how much is too much? And, and we never really answered that question. And the West German state had, had minimal interest in, in, in continuing to pursue this. There are periodic times when they did, but they're brief. And now in, in 2022, or last year in 2021, uh, there were proceedings against remaining Nazis uh, who were deemed uh, to be guilty by physical presence at, at a place where killing occurred. Right, and these are the trials of the, generally in their 90s, people of yes. guards. I'm struck by what you're saying about, because the denazification, and I'm reminded forcefully of my first uh, deployment to Iraq when we had the whole debathification process. If you were a member of the bath party, you couldn't do anything. And what we quickly realized is that meant the country didn't function. Uh, so you talk about the 40, no, 40 million cases, right? Well, we're obvi they obviously didn't get to all 40 million. So do, you, uh, do we know how many of those 40 million were actually adjudicated? Everybody got scanned or looked at in terms of people that were actually adjudicated and sentenced to some degree. We're talking roughly about 1% of the population. 1% of that 40 million. Right. right. So... Uh, and again, this the emphasis changed as we get closer to 1949, and then after 49, I mean, it just, it just the numbers just drop off a cliff. So, the, so there's really nothing, none of that going on. But again, with German society from 1933 forward, Nazism had so. I'm just going to make this. This is something I'm just making up. So this didn't really happen. So if you wanted to go bowling, you would have had to have been a member of the National Socialist Bowling Organization. It was that degree of, of infiltration down to the lowest things that you could possibly do in German society. Everything had some sort of a Nazi connection. And a lot of these organizations did terrible things even though their name was pretty innocuous. 
So even under, say, Nazi, the agriculture department or the agricultural uh, ministry, uh, they're doing things and experiments that, that would surprise most people. Um, there's a lot of, of evil that's done further that, that's far away from the court from courtroom uh, 600 at Nuremberg that you have to kind of get into the weeds of it, and the Americans really never had time, I think, to, to, to properly go through that. Now, from the American and then the German perspective, yeah. do you think that 99% that never saw a courtroom of any sort, right. was that more a function of true prioritization or more practicality of we've got to, we have to move on? I, I think it's the weight of numbers, because if you consider, uh, and I had a look at just this one region inside Bavaria, where you have this a, a, a prosecutor that is working so hard and so long that eventually he has a nervous breakdown. And it's because he, the sheer volume of cases that, that his, even his minist, you know, fairly tiny regional office has to handle, it, it's insane. So they have to review, they have to denazify, and then of those denazification cases, some of those have the potential to go into a criminal trial. So it results a criminal trial. Almost nobody gets put to a criminal trial. You've got a slightly better uh, percentage of people th that have some sort of a civil penalty that's applied through denazification. But most people know they just kind of skate. So we've been talking about the people who, whether they should have been prosecuted or not, weren't. Um, and you mentioned how two of the three of your subjects, uh, Harlan, kind of through his connections and presumably through his money, um, and, and Hitler through, as you mentioned, essentially jurisdiction shopping, managed to avoid prosecution. But we also have an example of somebody who was convicted um, in, in Ruprecht. So how was the case made against him? How, how did this question of, ultimately it's a question of intent, right? How was that actually prosecuted to a conviction? I, I think Ruprecht is distinguishable, different from Harland and Hippler in the sense that so many of his drawings had a, had a kind of a pornographic nature to them. So whereas you, you get the same, in some cases, the identical people that will testify on behalf of Harland, especially Harland, but also with Hippler, Ruprecht is out on an island by himself and he's radioactive. So he, first of all, is, is the cartoonist for Stryker and nobody wants to be friends with that guy. And secondly, his, his cartoons are so overtly perverted and pornographic that also nobody wants to be associated with that guy. And he doesn't present himself well. He keeps saying just a, a, a whole litany of stupid things when he's questioned uh, immediately after the war in connection with denazification. Circumstantially, I think Ruprecht, for all those reasons combined, uh, was his own worst advocate, and he was he was if you have if you pro, if you are, determine that Ruprecht is a Nazi and, and an active Nazi, and he advanced the aims of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, uh, Ruprecht is sort of tailor made for that role because yeah he did all of those things, and there's no question there were, there's less question in his case than there would be in the case of Harland who can claim, well, yeah, it was just a movie and it, there really wasn't any anti-Semitic intent. Ruprecht really has no defense like that at all because his work is, is, is viscerally just very of a different nature. But paradoxically, it's also, in some cases, the same. Harlan's movie used the image of the Jew as rapist. Ruprecht's cartoons had were hundreds of them have that same image of, of you know the, the the stereotypical Jew as the defiler of German womanhood. You bring up a fascinating concept, and I've just been kind of thinking as we've been uh, going along about other societies where it's like it's the horror is so in, is so deeply ingrained in the society that at a certain point it's it's hard to move on. You mentioned the case of Rwanda. I was I was thinking about South Africa after the end of apartheid. Uh, the United States uh, uh, at the end of the Civil War. All of these things. So, can can I can I get your impression on how does a society move forward when we've got lots of people that probably sh could and should be prosecuted, but if we did that, nothing else happens. So, how does a society move forward from that? 
it's something that did strike me until late in the, the process, which is I started thinking when I was reading through the transcripts, and there were uh, like a gazillion transcripts from the 1940s. Um, something that I didn't see, but it took me long to realize that I didn't see it, which is that in, in no case did the victims testify at any of these proceedings. So in the case of Ruprecht and his denazification case, there wasn't not a single Jew was was brought to testify. In the case of Hitler, there were no Jews that testified in the attempts to, to when they questioned him or when they attempted to get him in court. In Harlan's case, there was one representative of a Jewish group, but not somebody who was a a, a direct victim of Harlan per se. And part of the reason is those people were all dead. So it's a lot easier to have a smooth process when you don't have to worry about the thoughts or feelings or experiences of the people that you killed because there, 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 many, there are very few survivors left. Integration is easier for that reason alone. So, for example, when Adenauer comes out and, and the, uh, it, it, coincident with the formation of the Federal Republic, it is not a victim-centered approach. It is focused on the offenders who have somehow become victims of allied justice instead of the people that were actually murdered being the focus. It becomes an offender focus, not a victim focused. So practicality trumping morality almost. Sure. And, and again, it, 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 this is not... We could talk about this in different contexts. For uh, In the American case with Me Lai, where the killer becomes folk hero in ways actually that even the, the even German the Germans in the 1940s would have found obscene. So, uh, I mean, uh, Callie has a, a, a song written about him. Callie has you know, uh, the killer, you know, the lieutenant who's the, the convicted for Milai. Folk songs, rallies, people couldn't couldn't do enough to help and support Callie. Uh, that was an, a to a degree that, that would have even been absent in Germany. And I'm, I'm struck by what you're talking about, as I imagine you were also struck um, in, in this realization, uh, remembering the recordings of the Eichmann trial, where if I'm remembering correctly, there were several survivors who testified. Sure. And, and so much of the drama of that trial was around their testimony. Well, and it's Eichmann, and even there are uh, war crimes trials uh, that, that occur both in Germany and, and elsewhere after the war, you know, throughout the, let's see, well, the last one of these would have been, um, well, in some cases until fairly recently, where victim testimony is the, is the, it's the gravamen of the case. It's it, understanding what the, what the offender did to the victims and, 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 and explaining this very carefully. And that just wasn't wasn't happening in 19, you know, 46 or 47 or 48. Mm -hmm. Again, partially because at least the victims in in the region where the courts had jurisdiction, they, they just simply didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's a different sensibility, I think, we have both in terms of legal and, and maybe moral storytelling that has developed since 1945. Yeah, and I'm going to ask you to do something that might perhaps... Um, even be distasteful, but if oh, you, oh great! <laughs> if you put your your prosecutor hat on, um, do you think these prosecutors got it right? Do you think they put their cases together in, in in a way, and not necessarily in a hindsight way, but just as as someone who has done this? Do you think they took the right approach? I, I think the Harlan cases with the two criminal trials. I think his prosecutor was well intentioned, but he was inept. Uh, he seemed surprised by the testimony his own witnesses gave, and that's never a good sign. The one prosecutor um, who was Freiherr uh, von Munchausen, as in Baron von Munchausen, the same family, uh, he was a superb, superb prosecutor, and I think he had the goods on, on Hitler, and he would, he would have nailed him if he had the opportunity. And the prosecutor for Ruprecht was the same thing, too, but he was he couldn't get the judicial system to convert Ruprecht into a criminal trial, and it, which, he, which he, he certainly would have loved to have happen. 
So I think in terms of the prosecution, it, all three cases, they wanted to, to get the people that were guilty. And circumstances just weren't on their side. Why these three? Right, so I know that some of those are kind of what you chose to focus on. But are these representative? Are they the most egregious or uh, I mean and were these the only three uh, guys that were kind of prosecuted for incitement uh, and kind of their ilk the filmmakers or whatnot or are they well I, I want to look so these are the only three that were ever where it was ever connected that that image somehow was insightful these three alone so Hitler Harlan and, and Ruprecht um, so we get, for example, to Lani Riefenstahl, who was the director of you know, The Triumph of the Will. And when she goes on her denazification case, they're, they're concerned about her connection to Hitler, but nobody ever explicitly talks about her as insightful. They talk about her as supporting the regime, which she did, but not that she was using propaganda that was insightful to commit murder. And those are two very distinct things. I mean, you, you, you can build Hitler up, and she did, obviously, with the, the, the imagery in, in Triumph of the Will. Um, but not that you were that this was fuel to convert people from not killer into killer. And, and that's really what I wanted to look at to see if, if you what it looked like to try to make the case of image as incitement. You, you you brought uh, Lenny Riefenstahl into this discussion as as one of the um, certainly noted filmmakers of the Nazi era, and and I, I think film critics have kind of turned and said maybe she didn't make as great of art as has previously been thought, but she is still thought of as one of the foundational artists uh, filmmakers. Um, what do you make of the you know quality is a bad a bad term to apply to Nazi propaganda, but what do you make of the art value of these these three men you looked at, as opposed to Riefenstahl, who people will acknowledge there is an art value to her work? There, there, there are different levels, and it's the, the production values, for example, in, in Harlan's film are quite good. Forget the content for a second. We'll, we'll just talk about cinematography and, and, and how movies are put together and, 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 and camera angles and dialogue and the rest of that. So, and by the way, throughout this process, I had to watch a lot, a lot of really horrible, badly put together movies from the 1920s and 1930s. A lot of, a lot of them. Um, so Harlan's film, it, it just from, from, from a... From one perspective, it is a, a quality film. Uh, Rupert, excuse me, Hitler's is crude. Uh, its narration is weird. It is. It, it is. It is. The, the camera angles are strange. It, it's just this bad bouillabaisse base of, 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 of film techniques, and it was never going to be a good motion picture in the sense that 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 something else might be. Um, and I think that is an interesting question which in terms of what what is what's your audience and how do you want to reach them are you better off with images of hatred in the form of a of a well put together motion picture or are you appealing to the sort of man on the street not very sophisticated not well educated person who's going to react better to crude propaganda as opposed to slick well produced propaganda and, and what did you find in that regard? Was was the high art a better approach, the Riefenstahl, or was kind of the, the more uh, folk art approach? More I, I think I would probably leave that to Josef Goebbels, who himself was, was of course, a war criminal. Uh, he thought that Hitler's film was just bad, that it was ineffective, and that it was, was kind of stupid. Uh, he had nothing but high praise for, for Harlan's movie. And I think with Goebbels, with the eye in mind toward making people hate Jews, he was an expert. And I think he was exactly right about it. I think Harlan's film, Analog, does more long-term damage because the message is more subtle. And the filmgoers are going to leave with the, the anti-Semitic message in their head, but not in a way that's going to strike maybe their 
their daily consciousness and maybe that's not really maybe that's not what you want it to do you want it to be more clever and, and connect connected in in ways that that you're never going to get there with the Hitler stuff or with the the, the crude nonsense that that Ruprecht is putting up you mentioned something and I've thought about this quite a bit is he said you had to wade through a significant amount of rather horrible stuff. Uh, people trying either well or crudely to spread hate. Yeah. And so it, how do you how do you how do you like handle that as a person when well, you have to weed way through that? Well, it okay. Let, let me distinguish that a little bit. So it wasn't all. I'm not. I'm not watching just <clears throat> insightful movies. I'm watching every movie that Harlan made. I'm watching the this. Tr- there's actually kind of a trio of uh, movies involving Jews that, that come out in, in in 1939 and 1940. I'm watching German cinema generally just to see if I so I can learn the language of it and figure out what it's like. So you get pictures that are really remarkable, and a lot of them that are badly produced, badly acted, badly written, badly lit, and you still have to to to, to keep watching. So I, I've, I've become like an accidental amateur expert in, in, in both good and really awful German movies from, from the 1930s. That could be your next career. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but, but, on the, but on that note, because you also, you also teach war crimes. Yeah. And you also, I mean, this is something that you professionally deal with quite a bit. And it takes you to kind of the darker places of, of humanity. So when you're uh, when you're talking to uh, your students and younger scholars and you're uh, on how to approach this stuff, how do you kind of keep them from staying in those dark places? I think it's like anything else that I think you you can choose to marinate in something and, and it and it doesn't. It's not going to be healthy to do that. So it, it's a question of do it, do your work, do it as well as you can. Go to the depth as far as you can go, but you need to have happier places where, where you spend most of your time, and, and it's with people, it's with you know getting outside, it's with reading, watching, talking about things that are not that, and that kind of keeps you hopefully refreshed to keep doing your work. How did the prosecutors of these men and in these trials, how did they approach this? Were they looking at it from kind of a legalistic perspective? These men violated the law, social norms, or did they have the kind of the, the righteous anger approach? The, the good ones, and, and I think in their own way, like the three prosecutors that I was looking at closely, and I looked at some of their other cases too, um, I think they were... Especially Freiherr von Munchausen, I think what Hitler did offended him as a human being. So it's not a question just of a prosecutor who's good at their job and is determined to do it with zeal. And and, and he, he he hated Hitler and what he did. And I was very drawn to that. I I, I think I identified with that because I think unless with, with any of these things, unless you are it somehow just offends you and make if it doesn't ma- offend you and make you mad then I don't know what to say because I, I think all of this does that for me yeah and I think that ties back to what we have been talking about right as you watch a Vite Harlan film and you see that he is a skilled filmmaker and a skilled propagandist some part of you also has to say the the air quotes good of his skill means that he is a more effective anti-Semite and a more effective kind of input to the Holocaust. So uh, how do you act in that headspace? How do you survive in that headspace? I, 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 I think coming back to the same thing too, which is I think you, you, you can want, I think there's probably some corrosive danger that comes from, if I sit down and I watch Yud Sus 20 times, and I'm not injecting some sort of, of, of a cushion between myself and that. I, I don't know what that would do. I don't think it would do anything good. I think it would either numb me to it or, worst case, 
what would happen if, if even part of my brain started to think that this was somehow okay? You, you, you're, you're, you're swimming in a minefield. Mm -hmm. Touching the minds is bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that brings us to, to, I think, part of why you do this. Um, you know, I study 250-year-old French armies. Uh, Dr. Nance studies the armies of World War II, and th those are certainly valuable as history. Uh, but what you study has a direct correlation, influence, and importance to the present and the future. Um, so, so walk us through the importance of these men, their, their propaganda, and their trials, successful or not. What, what, do, you think, what do you think the importance is? I, I'm, I'm struck by stuff that's happened to, with us in the last, let's say, 20 years. And, and, and there is no valid comparison whatsoever between us and the SS and Nazi Germany, except in this case. There have been instances where, uh, where Americans have murdered mm -hmm. and killed. Not often, not in any sizable numbers, but it's happened. And to some degree, the people involved in this were, were made to feel that what they did was acceptable, it was okay. Now, whether that was because of propaganda, whether that was because of their background or education or, or whatever the thing was, something turned person from this thing to the other thing. And it doesn't have to be Vi Harlan, and it doesn't have to be Fritz Hippler, it doesn't have to be Philip Ruprecht. But the same sort of triggers are with us as they were in 1941 or 1942. And I think unless we talk about that, we are likely to get more of these things and position people in places where they're going to commit them. And I, I don't think we probably want to live in that place. Swimming in a minefield with a blindfold. Right? Very much so, yeah. I, from, your, from your lawyer side, you... you talked about this in the introduction as being a study of incitement and this legal, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, prosecutorial principle. Yeah. Um, how does this study of history of these trials inform your knowledge, skills, and practice in the law? It's made me sort of hyper aware that pursuing incitement as a charge is very tenuous. There's so much subjectivity, there's so many things that frankly are, are very difficult, if not impossible, to prove, but for things like the Rwanda case, and there are a few others. But as a general charge, it hasn't aged well. Uh, the number of people in the international arena that have been convicted, I can name on one hand. Uh, we don't charge incitement often, and I think part of that is because the elements of the crime favor the person who's done the inciting rather than society as a whole, and, and that's sort of our fault. I think the charge, that there is something to it, but I think that, that we've adopted kind of a clumsy formulation to try to figure out what, what incitement actually means. Yeah, especially if there's detachment between the artist and the product, right? Yeah, and people, the weird thing is in, in academic law, and this kind of goes back to the practice versus, you know, the, the theory, um, you can't get agreement on, on very much at all. So people will say, well, it does, do you need, do, do, what, it, what's the role of intent or what's the role in causation? And if we can't even get basic agreement on something that is as simple as the elements of the crime, I don't think that that says something good about the viability of the charge. Yeah, and, and with any art or artist, you also have that school of thought that says you must separate the art from the artist. Yeah, and I, I think, agree. I think film studies does that with Riefenstahl to some extent. Um, do you see a danger there? I think it allows people like Harlan who, who at some level certainly knowingly are advancing hatred to hide behind a shield of, 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 of again, art for art's sake, that 
the artist is only showing a vision, it's a fiction, it's just an experiment, but it does unfortunately real world harm, and in this case real world extermination. Uh, I, I, in that respect I suppose we haven't really changed much since 1940 in the sense of people denying responsibility for the things that they do. And, and certainly anti-Semitism and, and the same kinds of languages and images that produced the Holocaust are still with us. Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, the poster for the film you've mentioned, Yudzus, mm -hmm. is the yellow one with the, the grossly stereotyped uh, Jewish figure on the front. Am I remembering that correctly? No, you, you, you think that the yellow poster is the Der Ewige Jude, and that was for an, a, a traveling exhibit that okay. was a, actually ahead of the movie, that with the documentary that was made. The Yudzus poster... Um, is just as vile. It, the the, um, the first-run poster is just a stereoty stereotypical uh, Jew looking face in, into the, or uh, face forward, just as bad and just as, as useful for the purposes of, of the Nazis as, as the other poster is. Mm -hmm. and, and I know in discussions that we've had, you have seen this and similar images in the modern world, right? Oh, so this they're, is they're, not an issue they're, of the they're, past. They're, uh, Ruprecht stuff is alive and well in the open corners of the internet, and it's getting worse, not getting better. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a, a good takeaway for listeners who, who aren't necessarily historians or lawyers, that this these these problems are still with us. Yeah, and I th except I think it's metastasized. So in, in the case of, of 1940s, it was there was a thinner, a cleaner line between creation of the images or the product and the audience. Whereas now you've diffused it to where the audience itself is the creator of the thing that the of the cancer. It's become impossible. So if it was difficult to control these sorts of outrages in 1940, it's now impossible to do it in 2022 because it's self-generating and we're never gonna see the end of it. It's gotten so much worse than, than the people at Nuremberg ever thought that it possibly could become because I think that they believed that it was, by handling this the right way, we could start to minimize and instead we've gone in the other, other direction entirely. Well, that's a, that's a fascinating discussion and, and um, a very important topic. I'm glad you have been researching it, Dr. Hall. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips, where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty so you can get to know them.